Section 4 of the Memorable Thoughts of Socrates by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Memorable Thoughts of Socrates by Xenophon. Translated by Edward Bish. Book 1, Chapter 4 socrates proveth the existence of a deity if there be any who believe what some have written by conjecture that socrates was indeed excellent in exciting men to virtue but that he did not push them forward to make any great progress in it let such reflect a little on what he said not only when he endeavoured to refute those that boasted they knew all things but likewise in his familiar conversations and let them judge afterwards if he was incapable to advance his friends in the paths of virtue i will in the first place relate a conference which he had with aristodemus surnamed the little touching the deity for he had heard that he never sacrificed to the gods that he never addressed himself to them in prayer that he never consulted the oracles and even laughed at those that practised these things he took him to talk in this manner tell me aristodemus are there any persons whom you value on account of their merit he answered yes certainly tell me their names added socrates aristodemus replied for epic poetry i admire homer as the most excellent for dithyrambics melanipides sophocles for tragedy polycletus for statuary and zeuxis for painting which artists said socrates do you think to be most worthy of your esteem and admiration they who make images without soul and motion or they who make animals that move of their own accord and are endowed with understanding no doubt the last replied aristodemus provided they make them not by chance but with judgment and prudence socrates went on as there are some things which we cannot say why they were made and others which are apparently good and useful tell me my friend whether of the two you rather take to be the work of prudence than of hazard it is reasonable said aristodemus to believe that the things which are good and useful are the workmanship of reason and judgment do not you think then replied socrates that the first former of mankind designed their advantage when he gave them the several senses by which objects are apprehended eyes for things visible and ears for sounds of what advantage would agreeable sense have been to us if nostrils suited to their reception had not been given and for the pleasures of the taste how could we ever have enjoyed these if the tongue had not been fitted to discern and relish them further does it not appear to you wisely provided that since the eye is of a delicate make it is guarded with the eyelid drawn back when the eye is used and covering it in sleep how well does the hair at the extremity of the eyelid keep out dust and the eyebrow by its prominency prevent the sweat of the forehead from running into the eye to its hurt how wisely is the ear formed to receive all sorts of sounds and not to be filled with any to the exclusion of others are not the four teeth of all animals fitted to cut off proper portions of food and their grinders to reduce it to a convenient smallness the mouth by which we take in the food we like is fitly placed just beneath the nose and eyes the judges of its goodness and what is offensive and disagreeable to our senses is for that reason placed at a proper distance from them in short these things being deposed in such order and with so much care can you hesitate one moment to determine whether it be an effect of providence or of chance i doubt not of it in the least replied aristodemus 
and the more i fix my thoughts on the contemplation of these things the more i am persuaded that all this is the masterpiece of a great workman who bears an extreme love to men what say you continued socrates to this that he gives all animals a desire to engender and propagate their kind that he inspires the mothers with tenderness and affection to bring up their young and that from the very hour of their birth he infuses into them this great love of life and this mighty aversion to death i say replied aristodemus that it is an effect of his great care for their preservation this is not all said socrates answer me yet farther perhaps you would rather interrogate me you are not i persuade myself ignorant that you are endowed with understanding do you then think that there is not elsewhere an intelligent being particularly if you consider that your body is only a little earth taken from that great mass which you behold the moisture that composes you is only a small drop of that immense heap of water that makes the sea in a word your body contains only a small portion of all the elements which are elsewhere in great quantity there is nothing then but your understanding alone which by a wonderful piece of good fortune must have come to you from i know not whence if there were none in another place and can it then be said that all this universe and all these so vast and numerous bodies have been disposed in so much order without the help of an intelligent being and by mere chance i find it very difficult to understand it otherwise answered aristodemus because i see not the gods who you say make and govern all things as i see the artificers who do any piece of work among us nor do you see your soul neither answered socrates which governs your body but because you do not see it will you from thence infer you do nothing at all by its direction but that everything you do is by mere chance aristodemus now wavering said i do not despise the deity but i conceive such an idea of his magnificence and self-sufficiency that i imagine him to have no need of me or my services you are quite wrong said socrates for by how much the gods who are so magnificent vouchsafe to regard you by so much you are bound to praise and adore them it is needless for me to tell you answered aristodemus that if i believed the gods interested themselves in human affairs i should not neglect to worship them how replied socrates you do not believe the gods take care of men they who have not only given to man in common with other animals the senses of seeing hearing and taste but have also given him to walk upright a privilege which no other animal can boast of and which is of mighty use to him to look forward to remote objects to survey with facility those above him and to defend himself from any harm besides although the animals that walk have feet which serve them for no other use than to walk yet herein have the gods distinguished men in that besides feet they have given him hands the instruments of a thousand grand and useful actions on which account he not only excels but is happier than all animals besides and further though all animals have tongues yet none of them can speak like man's his tongue only can form words by which he declares his thoughts and communicates them to others not to mention smaller instances of their care such as the concern they take of our pleasures in confining men to no certain season for the enjoying them as they have done other animals but providence taketh care not only of our bodies but of our souls it hath pleased the great author of all not only to give man so many advantages for the body but which is the greatest gift of all and the strongest proof of his care he hath breathed into him an intelligent soul 
and that too the most excellent of all for which of the other animals has a soul that knows the being of the deity by whom so many great and marvellous works are done is there any species but man that serves and adores him which of the animals can like him protect himself from hunger and thirst from heat and cold which like him can find remedies for diseases can make use of his strength and is as capable of learning that so perfectly retains the things he has seen he has heard he has known in a word it is manifest that man is a god in comparison with the other living species considering the advantages he naturally has over them both of body and soul for if man had a body like that of an ox the subtlety of his understanding would avail him nothing because he would not be able to execute what he should project on the other hand if that animal had a body like ours yet being devoid of understanding he would be no better than the rest of the brute species thus the gods have at once united in your person the most excellent structure of body and the greatest perfection of soul and now can you still say after all that they take no care of you what would you have them do to convince you of the contrary i would have them answered aristodemus send on purpose to let me know expressly all that i ought to do or not to do in like manner as you say they do give you notice what said socrates when they pronounce any oracle to all the athenians do you think they do not address themselves to you too when by prodigies they make known to the greeks the things that are to happen are they silent to you alone and are you the only person they neglect do you think that the gods would have instilled this notion into men that it is they who can make them happy or miserable if it were not indeed in their power to do so and do you believe that the human race would have been thus long abused without ever discovering the cheat do you not know that the most ancient and wisest republics and people have been also the most pious and that man at the age when his judgment is ripest has then the greatest bent to the worship of the deity my dear aristodemus consider that your mind governs your body according to its pleasure in like manner we ought to believe that there is a mind diffused throughout the whole universe that disposes all things according to its counsels you must not imagine that your weak sight can reach the objects that are several leagues distant and that the eye of god cannot at one and the same time see all things you must not imagine that your mind can reflect on the affairs of athens of egypt and of sicily and that the providence of god cannot at one and the same moment consider all things as therefore you may make trial of the gratitude of a man by doing him a kindness and as you may discover his prudence by consulting him in difficult affairs so if you would be convinced how great is the power and goodness of god apply yourself sincerely to piety and his worship then my dear aristodemus you shall soon be persuaded that the deity sees all hears all is present everywhere and at the same time regulates and superintends all the events of the universe by such discourses as these socrates taught his friends never to commit any injustice or dishonourable action not only in the presence of men but even in secret and when they are alone since the divinity hath always an eye over us and none of our actions can be hid from him End of section four.